General John Bacon was a handsome man. Matter of fact, by the age of 15, his remarkable sense of fashion had earned him the nickname Gentleman Johnny. A charming man by all accounts. Very bright. Did he? Is, is he doing this interview in a fake southern accent? Unfortunately, he also had a passion for gambling. Well, we all have our weaknesses. Of course, Bagan lost the biggest wager of his life. And that's why he's known today as the man who lost written the war. Wow, he's really committed to this. I mean, he's from the OC for crying out loud. In the winter of 1777, while the Americans camped in Morristown, New Jersey, British generals William Howe and John Burgoyne were hard at work planning for the coming year's campaign. Howe's sights were set on Philadelphia, the seat of the American Congress. Meanwhile, Burgoyne sailed back to Britain to propose a plan to the King's ministers to take Albany, New York. Success in this endeavor would complete the isolation of New England from the rest of the rebels, a process which had begun with the capture of New York the previous year. Of course, the British had always seen New England as the black sheep in the family. Problem was, none of these plans were coordinated. By April, Burgoyne had won approval for a plan to attack Albany from Canada. Howe, who was not given the reinforcements he felt he needed, decided to attack Philadelphia not by land across New Jersey, but rather by sea along the Delaware, effectively removing any possibility of his assisting with the Albany campaign. Howe naturally sent a letter to Britain informing the King's American secretary of his plans. In a stroke of luck for the Americans, however, this letter arrived in Britain after Burgoyne had already set sail. Burgoyne landed in Quebec on May 6th, 1777. On June 20th, he and his men set out for the American-held Fort Ticonderoga. By all accounts, at this point, Burgoyne was bursting with confidence, bordering on delusion. The weather was grand, and he had finally been given his own command, more than 8,300 men in total, including Germans, Canadians, and Iroquois. He also had his mistress with him. The German commander, Reed Asel, had brought his wife and three daughters. In fact, it was very much like they were setting out for a picnic rather than a war. We had conceived the idea of our being irresistible, wrote one soldier in his journal. By early June, the British had taken Fort Ticonderoga and were pursuing the fleeing Americans southward. While Burgoyne's journey over rough roads and ruined bridges proved difficult, he met no armed opposition. The American commander of the Northern Department, Philip Schuyler, whose daughters have since become famous on Broadway, had retreated to Stillwater, 12 miles south of Saratoga. On August 11th, facing impending shortages, Burgoyne sent a German contingent eastward in search of cattle and horses. Only four days later, American Brigadier John Stark surrounded and destroyed the party of 600. Now Burgoyne's confidence remained. He had a month's supply of food, and he remained blissfully unaware that Howe's army had embarked hundreds of miles away. So they continued on toward Albany. Meanwhile, Schuyler was replaced as American commander by General Horatio Gates, and Gates had no inclination to retreat further. Instead, he moved northward to make a stand at Bemis Heights. Burgoyne crossed the Hudson 10 miles above Bemis Heights and marched southward in three columns. Redazel on the left, Brigadier General James Hamilton in the center, and General Simon Fraser on the right. On September 19th, he made his move, hoping to take high ground to the west, which the Americans had left undefended. Upon learning of the British movement, Gates did nothing. Major General Benedict Arnold, sensing that troop movement would grant them an advantage, urged Gates to allow him to push forward. After three hours of argument, Gates finally relented whereupon Arnold and Colonel Daniel Morgan moved forward to meet the enemy. The two sides clashed at Freeman's Farm, about a mile north of Bemis Heights. For several hours, they exchanged blows, each showing courage and grit. Unfortunately for the British, Fraser never found the high ground to the west, and Redazel was late to the field. Meanwhile, Gates held back much of his force, to Arnold's chagrin. 
In the end, the Americans fell back and the British held the field, though at a terrible cost. 556 casualties in all. More importantly, unlike the Americans, they were deep in enemy territory and had no way of replacing their dead and wounded. Yet, for a time, Burgoyne remained heartened, apparently still expecting that he might receive some form of cooperation from Howe. In fact, Howe was 300 miles away in southeastern Pennsylvania on his way to Philadelphia. <laughs> a fortnight later, Burgoyne's spirits had dampened considerably. The American numbers had swollen to 11,000, while morale among his own men, sick, wounded, and running short of supplies, suffered. I imagine some of Bagon's men felt suddenly very alone. Not unlike when a child is in a grocery store and realizes his mama isn't with him anymore. Of course, I say I can only imagine it on account of I've never been to a grocery store, what with the drinking goat's blood for sustenance and all. Burgoyne might yet have retreated back to Canada. Instead, Gentleman Johnny decided to try his luck one more time. On October 7th, he sent three columns toward Bemis Heights, probing for weaknesses in the American defenses. Finding nothing to exploit, he formed a line about 1,000 yards long and waited. The Americans struck at 2.30 in the afternoon. Benedict Arnold, incidentally, had been removed from command after a heated argument with Gates. He took to the field anyway. The men liked him and followed him, and he led them brilliantly, even to the point of seizing some of the British works on Freeman's farm. This time around, Burgoyne was good and beaten. He retreated northward, leaving his sick and wounded behind in a field hospital. Five days later, Gates cut off the British retreat. Four days after that, Burgoyne agreed to surrender. This alone would have been a catastrophic loss for the British. 5,800 men, 27 field pieces, and other weapons and supplies all lost to the enemy. Yet the international implications were far worse. A mere four months later, France would join the war on the American side, encouraged by the Patriots' victory at Saratoga. So there you have it. Were we unfair to Burgoyne, or does he deserve the bulk of the blame for losing the war? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like down below and tap that Bigfoot face in the sky to subscribe. Until next time, this is Bigfoot saying so long, and save me a seat at your next campfire.